Hello, my name is Terry Stewart, and this is a tutorial being recorded for the uh, 2020 Telluride workshop. Um, and this is Nengo for Neuromorphs. All right, so what's that? Um, so first of all, oh, uh, let me go back there. Uh, this is me, the picture there on the right. I'm Terry Stewart. I'm a research officer with the National Research Council of Canada. Um, I've been a postdoc and um, research associate with uh, at the University of Waterloo for the last 10 years. Um, and during that time, I've sort of been developing all the tools and techniques um, that I'll be talking about. Um, the, the University of Waterloo, the lab that I'm affiliated with there is the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. Um, so that's um, headed by Chris Eliasmith. That's the picture there on the front top. Um, and a whole bunch of grad students that are there. And then there is also this spin-off company called Applied Brain Research, uh, which is mostly over there on the right, um, which is staffed pretty much primarily by graduates out of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, out of Chris's lab. Um, basically, we formed a spin-off company um, to look at sort of commercial applications of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm a advisor to the research company, but my actual, my, the, yeah, so I'm an advisor to ABR, um, but my actual day-to-day -day job is the National Research Council of Canada. Um, it's a government research lab that has uh, the main offices in Ottawa. There's something on the order of a thousand researchers um, doing just sort of covering all sorts of areas um, of science. Um, I'm in the new University of Waterloo Collaboration Center. So there's about six or seven um, NRC research officers who are there and housed at the University of Waterloo, specifically doing collaborations on um, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and Internet of Things. Um, and then there below, we've got pictures of my boss and my boss's boss. Um, so that's a little bit about my situation. Basically, I'm a full-time researcher. Um, and NRC hired me to continue doing exactly the sort of research that I have been doing for the last 10 years um, using the tools that I'm talking about today. So what am I talking about today? Uh, Nengo. It's um, a software for simulating neurons with a couple interesting features. Um, there's a whole bunch of different tools out there for doing neuron-based simulations. What's special about Nengo? Um, there's three big things that I think are going to be relevant um, for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, one of them is that the idea behind Nengo is to be able to target multiple hardware platforms. There's a whole bunch of neuromorphic hardware out there. I don't want to learn totally different software tools to use everything. Um, and so the, I, the goal is, the hope is, um, that Nengo can provide um, some sort of consistent interface to a lot of different um, hardware platforms. Um, so that's one aspect. Um, another aspect is an attempt to provide some parts of higher level abstractions so that instead of programming things on the level of individual neurons, um, there's going to be some aspects that you, I mean, certainly you can do things at the level of individual neurons, um, but there's also going to be some aspects where you can step up a little higher level of abstraction, describe what you want the system to do, and then have Nengo itself um, figure out what the details are. In particular, it can then figure out what the details are for the particular hardware that you're using. Um, so if different hardware have slightly different neuron models, that's going to mean slightly different connection weights are needed to do the sort of things that you want. Um, and the hope is that, for at least in some situations, Nengo can take care um, of adjusting those details for you. Right. Um, and then there's also another nice feature, which is that we have an interactive GUI. Um, that's what the... Um, uh, that's what all of the examples that I'm going to be providing today and sort of the hands-on tutorials that we're going to be going through, um, that's what we're going to make use of. Um, now, the nice thing is also the graphical interface is completely optional. Once you've built your model, you no longer need the graphical interface, um, but it's incredibly helpful when we're actually putting things together and trying to visualize what the heck's happening. Um, the full software framework there is the picture there on the right. Um, the idea is there is this central core of Nango that is purely written in Python and NumPy. There's no other dependencies. Um, we then also have, as a pretty high priority, um, uh, supporting deep learning aspects. Um, and to do that, we have it call out to TensorFlow. So we have tight integration with TensorFlow. 
Um, the graphical interface, of course, sits on top of that. Um, it's all written, written in a combination of Python and JavaScript. Um, that forms the core of the framework. There's a whole bunch of add-ons that are doing things like adding features to the system, adding different neuron models, adding um, you know, high-level structures um, like uh, decision-making circuits and winner-take-all circuits and uh, particular biological systems like um, a basal ganglia model. Um, so all of those sorts of things um, can be seen as sort of add-ons because they sort of just define a bunch of things using the basic components that are in the core framework. Um, and then below that, we have simulation backends. Those are taking the things that you describe using this high-level core framework um, and actually the, you know, customize them for particular hardware. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, um, but certain things like targeting CPUs, GPUs, um, some aspects of FPGAs, um, and also some aspects of uh, Luigi, which is um, one of the, um, which is, yeah, neuromorphic chip that we'll talk about more. In any case, so that's the sort of high level overview. Um, Dengo itself is free for non-commercial use, um, including all the source code is available, it's all on GitHub. Um, it is for non free for non-commercial use. Um, if you want commercial use, then yes, you do need a license through uh, Applied Brain Research. Um, ABR is also, so ABR um, owns the software uh, and also provides support and, um, and, and, and maintains and develops the software. Um, and it's, um, so it's, it's nice to actually have, have, have a you know, professional development actually making sure that the software is, uh, at least has some continuity. Um, as I said, it requires Python and NumPy. Um, if you are not familiar with Python, that's fine. That's great. We're hope, the hope is that uh, you can still follow along with these tutorials. Um, if you are familiar with Python, um, that should work with whatever Python you have lying around. Um, the, uh, if you are uh, totally fresh and want to follow along with these tutorials, um, and you do not have Python currently on your computer, my recommendation would be to download Anaconda. Um, there's a link there on the side. Um, the all Anaconda is is it's an install of Python that just has everything all pre-installed and and just it just comes with everything, so you never have to worry about installing things. Um, so all the yeah, um, it just has a good version of the math libraries and whatnot. So that's the easiest thing to do. Um, and then in order to install Mango itself. Um, you will open up the Anaconda command prompt or whatever Python you're using. Um, and the commands for installing the basics of Mango is pip install Mango. Uh, pip is the Python installation system. Um, and then to get the graphical interface, you'll also want pip install Mango GUI. Um, you just have to do that once. That should install things on your computer. And then in order to run the software, um, in order to run the graphical interface, we're just going to type Mango. Okay. Um, and that's going to be the core idea. And so let's go ahead and do that right now and show, I want to show two quick examples. I want to show an example of just sort of defining some neurons and connecting them up. And I will also want to show an example of doing some online learning. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, first thing we do is we go to a command prompt. Um, I've already done the pip install mango. Whoops, mango. Apparently I can't spell, so you'll do pip install Nango, and then you can do also do a pip install Nango GUI, and then once you've done those, you can run type Nango, and what should happen is you will get a browser window that'll pop up and look something like this. Reconfigure this a little bit, go up to full screen. So um, this graphical interface is running inside the um, just inside your browser. Um, all that's happening is here on the right is just, this is just a text editor. Um, if you like, if you have a preferred text editor that you like instead, you can go use that text editor as well. Um, and the idea is going to be that um, whatever it is that we type over here on the right is going to get visualized over here on the left. Okay. Um, but let's start fresh. So I'm going to start a new file. I'm just going to click here. Uh, and make a totally new file called example one. Um, that's just in whatever directory you started Nango from. And let's go ahead and just delete all of this so that we can start fresh. 
Okay. So um, over here on the right is our code. What is this we're going to do? So very first thing we need to do in any of these things is import Mango. So all that's doing is that's a command to Python saying, hey, there's this library that we've all installed called Mango. Please give me access to it. Um, so that's all fine. And then the very next thing that we're going to do is we are going to create a model. And this model is going to be a Nango network. So a network, so Nango dot something is how we know that this is a thing that is defined inside the Nango package. Um, and a network is just Nango terminology for just a container that holds a bunch of stuff. So it's just, it's just an organizational thing. It doesn't actually have any, um, any actual meaning in terms of the neuron model. It's just um, a container to put a bunch of things and we'll go ahead and put a bunch of neurons and connections in that container. Uh, the way we indicate that we're about to put a bunch of things into a network um, is we say with model. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's just going to mean that anything that I now type, if anything, so if I create neurons, I create connections between neurons, they're automatically going to be added inside that network. Python is a programming language where indentation matters. Um, so that's why the editor automatically indented here for me. Um, and that's, so, so anything that is indented, that's what's going to be, um, it's going to be added. And so the very first thing that we should probably add is some neurons, right? Um, we're going to give this some variable name. I'll just call it, I don't know, neurons. And the terminology for a group of neurons, so we tend in Nango, we tend very, very seldom are you sort of creating one neuron at a time. Um, our terminology is it's an ensemble. Um, and now we need to specify some parameters of this ensemble. Okay, so it's going to be a group of neurons. There's two required parameters. Um, one of them sort of makes sense. One of them is n neurons. Oops, n neurons. Okay, that's the number of neurons. So I don't know, we're going to do 10 neurons. The second parameter that you always have to specify isn't going to make much sense right now. The second parameter is going to say is going to be dimensions, and we're going to say dimensions equals one. Uh, what's that going to mean? <sighs> we're going to get to it eventually. The intent is going to be it's going to be something like if we're doing distributed representations, um, how much information are these neurons going to represent? That should make no sense at all right now. We will talk about it much more later. Just for now, blindly copy what I'm doing and say, all right, dimensions equals one. Okay, now we have a bunch of these neurons. The default, so there's a whole bunch of different neuron types. The default neuron type is the leaky integrate and fire neuron. Okay. But there's also sigmoid neurons. There's also rate neur there's, uh, there's, uh, rectified linear neurons. So there's both spiking and non-spiking neurons. Um, leaking the great and fire neuron is sort of the simplest spiking neuron model. So we'll stick with that. Um, that's, it's also the default um, in Mango. Um, and one thing that maybe is a little surprising um, is that whenever we have groups of neurons in Mango, they automatically have a gain and a bias parameter. So each neuron can have a different background sort of bias parameter, and each neuron can have a different gain parameter. So I'm going to specify the gain. So for, for this example, I'm going to, I want the gain to be, I will just set the gain to be one for all of these neurons. Um, if I wanted to, I could sort of write that like this. That's going to get really boring. I don't want to write it that way. Instead, I'm going to start, um, since we're going to start needing some sort of math libraries and things like this, this is going to be a good excuse to start using the, the Python um, math libraries. Um, and one, the, the most common Python math library is called NumPy. Um, so we're going to go ahead and import that. Um, sort of by convention among Python programmers, whenever you import NumPy, you say import NumPy as NP. And that just means that in the future, I don't have to refer to NumPy.something. I can just write NP.something. So that's the sort of standard lazy programmer. I don't want to type five letters when two letters would do. Um, it's got sort of the same capabilities as something like MATLAB. It's got a very similar sort of um, sets of tools. And one thing it can do in particular um, is give me a set of 10 ones, right? So that's just 
it's just a, a vector of 10 ones. Um, and then the bias we're going to set uh, to a vector of 10 zeros. Okay. All right. Um, so there's a bunch of neurons. They have some gain, they have some bias. Um, there they are. Uh, just Nengo always draws. So the moment I, I finished typing that code, we had this icon appear. Um, Nengo just always draws six or one, two, three, four, five, yeah, six dots. Um, it's not dependent on the number of neurons that you've written there, um, but this is going to be a representation of that group of, of neurons. All right, that's fine. It's not really doing all that much. Um, one thing we can do with this already, though, is we can right click on this and we can do something. Let's click on spikes. Okay, and that's going to be showing the spikes coming out of our neurons. Um, we can also press save up here. That's the save icon. That's going to save our file. Um, and we can also press play. When we press play and we're running things and nothing is happening. And that's not too surprising because we've got no input to these neurons and the bias, so, and the bias input is zero, so like nothing, so these neurons aren't firing, so yes, we're not seeing any spikes coming out of these neurons. Um, we could do some weird things, like we could play around with this bias and we could um, adjust it, um, but let's instead, let's create an input that we can feed into these into this thing. Okay. Um, and just because, again, I'm going to be lazy about typing, let's instead of calling this neurons, let's call it n. There we are. And I'm going to be pedantic and sort of align this stuff. This, this alignment here doesn't matter, but it makes me feel better. All right, you will also notice when I change the name of that variable, this changed to an n. Okay, so this is just sort of indicating what variable is referring to this. Excellent. Now let's provide some input. So this is going to so we've introduced networks and we've introduced ensembles. Now we're going to introduce what we are use what we'll use for inputs and outputs um, and basically anything that's not neurons um, in an Engo model um, and that's what we call a node. Um, and so we're going to call this I don't know this is the stimulus is a node. And when you define a node, you can put something here that will says okay well what will this node do? What sort of value will this node output? It can be a full function. Um, what we're just going to do is we're going to say this is a node that just outputs, uh, let's say it outputs a 2 all the time. Okay. So that is just a thing that outputs a 2 all the time. And now we're going to connect it up. So this is going to be the fourth Nengo object that we've defined. This is going to be a connection. And for a connection, you say where it starts from. So it starts from stimulus. And we're going to connect that into the first one of these neurons. Okay. So the way I say that is I say n, and then I say, all right, I want to refer to the neurons inside of n. So that's n.neurons. And I just want to refer to the first neuron. So I'm just going to do that. Okay. So the square bracket syntax, that's what Python uses for um, indexing into an array. There's 10 neurons, so, and Python starts counting at 0. Um, so n neuron 0 says I'm going to connect to the first of the neurons. Okay. And now if I do that, I can pull up the spike plot and press play. And look, the neuron is firing a lot. All right, so that's fine and not too exciting. Um, let's do a little bit more. The moment you create a node in Nango, you can right click on the node object and you can pull up a slider. And that's going to let you control that input as time goes by. Okay. Um, that slider is going to have some range um, that it can go between. You can adjust that range. So I'm going to right click on that and say set range. And I'm going to say let's change it between 0 and 2. So that's going to say what's the limits on this slider. And now when I press play, that same thing is happening, but I can pull it down and it stops firing and it starts firing, stops firing starts firing, fires more. All right, we have some sort of control over our neurons. The leaky integrate and fire neuron, of course, since it's leaky, you know, if I just have a little bit of input, this is not enough input for the neuron to fire. With the default parameter settings, a leaky integrate and fire neuron 
needs an input of one in order to start firing. And so, yeah, one is not quite enough for it to fire. Any value above one will be enough for it to fire. Okay. Again, you can adjust those parameters um, on that on there. But we now have an input that can go to some neurons. But that's only going to one neuron. It'd be really nice to sort of do more than that. So let's take this opportunity to make connections from these neurons back to themselves. So let's, let's and let's as sort of the simplest sort of thing we might want to do is let's connect the first neuron to the second neuron, the second neuron to the third neuron, the third neuron to the fourth neuron, and so on and so forth. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, that sounds like a connection weight matrix. So let's go ahead and make a connection weight matrix. Um, it's going to be zeros. So initially, we're going to make a big matrix of all zeros. Um, and it's going to be a 10 by 10 matrix. So that's just Python for make me a matrix of all zeros. Um, and then I'm just going to go set some ones in that. And so I'm just going to say i plus 1 comma i is 1. OK, so that's just setting ones on the diagonal, um, or just slightly off diagonal. Um, if we want to sort of go, OK, I'm not quite sure I wrote that right, one thing you can do is you can print that. Okay, Anything you print inside this code is going to end up appearing down here. Okay. And that's my kind of nice little matrix. So that's, that's my connectivity matrix. Seems fine. And now we're just going to make a connection from n neurons to n neurons. And now we're going to specify this connection matrix. Um, and we're going to say transform equals w. So transform is our terminology for I'm giving you a connection weight matrix. If you don't give it a connection weight matrix, it will assume the identity matrix. That's what happened up here in this, on this one here, because we're connecting one thing to one thing. Yes, I could have put a connection weight in there. I could have said, I don't know, multiply it by minus two or something. Um, again, that would be, I could say, a comma transform equals and specify. Okay. Now that we've got this sort of connection all set up, let's see what it does. I'm just going to go ahead and run that. All right. So what's happening there? As I, as that first neuron fires, all of a sudden stuff happens. It's not all that visible what's going on. So let's take this as an opportunity. We're going to pause our simulation. So one thing we can do to sort of take a closer look at what happened there is we can grab this blue bar and pan backwards. So Mango automatically um, remembers some past history of time. It's still hard to see what exactly happened there. So let's make this graph a little bigger. All right. Still a little hard to see what's happening there. This window that we're moving back and forth, you can resize. So if I resize it, it's going to get a little smaller. And now maybe we can see what's going on here. All right. So that first neuron, the neuron that we're specifically connecting into, it fired. That connected to the next neuron. That caused this neuron to fire a whole bunch which caused the next neuron to fire, which caused the next neuron to fire, and so on. Why did the next neuron fire a little bit? Like, what, you know, this, this neuron fired, why, why did that cause the next neuron to fire a whole bunch? The reason for that is Nango also, whenever you make a connection, can you um, can put in some sort of synapse model there. So does a spike just cause input to go into the next neuron just at one instant, um, or does that spike cause input into the next neuron over a bit of time? Okay. Um, Mango supports a whole bunch of different synapse models. Um, the most common model, uh, the easiest to use model, is uh, just a low-pass filter, um, just sort of the standard exponential decay. Um, and indeed, that's the sort of, that's the default. Um, so when we did this connection back to ourself, the default was a synapse. Um, uh, so the default, the full default is Nango low pass of 0 0.005. Oops, too many zeros. So that's a five millisecond um, uh, time constant. So that's why it, that's how we know how quickly that's going to decay. Um, in fact, low pass filters are so common in Nango that even if you just specify 
0.005, it'll go, okay, I assume you mean a low-pass filter of uh, 5 milliseconds. Um, but of course, you can change that. Um, if we changed it to 0, right, that would be a um, just a perfect impulse response. So basically, that's how you would say there's no synapse. So if we run that, so now you can see one neuron spikes, causes the next neuron, causes the next neuron, causes the next neuron. So there's just sort of a one time step delay in there. So a synapse of zero means one time step delay. Um, but then uh, you could also have uh, different sort of synapses, right? So you could also say, all right, I don't know, I want a hundred millisecond synapse. Um, and now when that one neuron fires, oops, that one neuron is just gonna, you know, well, okay, now everything is gonna get spiked. Um, all right, so we can go ahead and play around with those synapse parameters and get different effects. Cool. All right, so, um, so that's basically just giving the sort of, if you just want to use Nango as a totally normal neuron simulator of, hey, define groups of neurons, connect them up, use different neuron models. We can go ahead and do that. Specify your connection weights. Um, you can go ahead and see how all of that works. One further feature that I want to sort of show and explore is um, putting in a little bit of learning. Okay, so that's going to be our next example. Um, and we're going to go on to example two. And we're just going to go ahead and delete all this. Uh, model is Nango network with model. Okay, so what are we going to do here? The idea of what I want for this example is I want to take some input, feed it into a bunch of neurons, and then I want to um, train the output from these neurons. Um, and we'll have some sort of gradient descent, some sort of here, some sort of error-driven learning rule. Given this input, this is the output that I want. Um, so sort of, this is just like the simplest thing, the simplest sort of supervised learning that you might want to do with a neural network. All right, so let's make a group of neurons. Uh, this is an ensemble. Um, we're going to have a few neurons. I don't know. Let's do let's do 100 neurons. And I'm going to be feeding in an input to all 100 of these neurons. I don't want to specify a big giant connection wave range. So I don't want to specify the gains and the biases. Um, this is We're starting to get into a point where I would really like Nango to just do things for me. Okay. I certainly could go ahead and say, all right, there was that dimensions equals one thing that I just sort of said, all right, you always have to do. All right. And then we would have these sorts of gain equals, uh, oops, I forgot to go ahead and import NumPy. Okay. E dot, I don't know, ones, a hundred and bias is zeros, a hundred. All right. We can go ahead and do that. And we got a group of neurons. We've got some sort of input that we want to go into these neurons, but I really want this input to go to all of these neurons, right? And this is one input going to a hundred neurons. That's going to be a hundred by one weight matrix. I don't want to specify that. Instead, I'm just going to do this. What in the world does that mean? Okay, you'll know, so the, the difference is, so before I was saying connect to the individual neurons, right? I was saying that sort of thing. Um, if I try that right now, it's going to give me an error because, well, the stimulus is one thing, the neurons is 100 things. I'm going to need to specify, you know, I can't connect one thing to 100 things. You know, I could specify like a weight matrix, um, but then I'd have to build my own weight matrix for that. And I'm just, uh, I don't want to specify that. Instead, I'm just going to do this. What this is meaning is this is telling Nango, hey, there's that dimensions thing that I mentioned before. Just go ahead and randomly connect this stimulus to A's, to those hundred neurons. There is a whole 
you know, like there's a connection weight matrix there. Give me some, just, just make a bunch of connections. Connect everybody randomly. Right? And in fact, we're going to go even farther than that. This gain and bias thing that we specified before, let's get rid of it. Because I don't want all of my neurons to be identical. I don't want my neurons to have exactly the same gain, exactly the same bias. Right? I mean, that's exactly, you know, in all neural networks, you generally want, you know, there's 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 some sort of distribution of these things. There's some sort of, you know, the, you want the best gains and biases for the particular task. Um, we don't want to specify that ourselves, so we're just going to get rid of that. Right, and now we've got, now we're down to sort of the basic or the simplest Mingo um, code. And that's just saying, hey, there's 100 neurons. And this is, again, where this dimensions equals one starts being something meaningful. Because that's saying, when I make these sorts of arbitrary connections coming into these neurons, expect that thing to be one value. Right. So it's saying when we generate all these random connections, um, it's a 100 by 1 weight matrix there. We'll be talking about that a lot more um, in the next sort of, uh, in the next little while, um, but that's just sort of preparing for what's going on. Um, all right, so first of all, let's make sure that worked. So I've got some sort of slider here, and I've got some spikes, and I press play. And all right, fine. I've got, yeah, as I move this input around, the neurons respond differently to that. All right, great. So what? Well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do some sort of learning in the system, right? So what we're looking for is to have the output be some function of the input. Okay. Um, or, you know, given this input, what should the output be? So we're going to need some sort of output. Um, this is output we're also going to have be a node, but this isn't a node that just sort of outputs zero all the time. This is a node that just literally takes an input and does nothing to it and just outputs exactly the same as the input. So this is a node that does nothing. The way we specify that is a node none, but we do need to specify to Mango um, how many dimensions it's, it's looking for. So we're going to say that the size of this thing is one. Okay. So that's this thing here. Nango draws this kind of node as just a dot, just as a visual reminder that it's not, there's nothing going on here. There's no, um, yeah, it's not producing anything, it's not creating anything, it is just sort of gathering gathering the data that's fed into it. There's no nonlinearity, there's no nothing. Okay. And then we're going to make a connection from those neurons to that output. Okay, we're going to make a connection from the neurons to that output. If I just do that, Nengo's going to yell at me because, hold on a second, neurons is 100 things, output is one thing. What do you want me to do here? Well, in this case, we know what we want it to do here. Because right now, when we're just sort of specifying at the beginning of learning, let's just set all of those weights to zero. Let's go ahead and reorganize the code a little bit. There we are. Okay, so that's saying give me a whole bunch of connection weights that are all zero between here and the output. Okay. So I right click on the output graph and I say value. Now it'll show that value. I press play. And as I go ahead and vary this, well, all those weights are zero. So of course my output is going to be zero all the time. All right, fine. I want to do some sort of learning on this connection here. How am I going to do that? Well, with any sort of supervised learning, I need some sort of error signal. So let's create an error signal. It's also going to be a node. Okay. Fine, I have an error signal. How, what do we want the error to be? Well, it's going to depend on what 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 the supervised training is that we want here. So if we had some sort of external error signal, you know, given some input, we would create some output. We can go ahead and do that. Um, let's go ahead and do a the simplest thing possible, which is let's just make the error be the difference between the output and the stimulus. Okay, so that would be trying to train this thing to be an identity function. So please output exactly the same value as the input. 
Um, so we'll just do that first and then we can pick a different function. So if I want this value to be the difference between this and this, well, I can just do that with this connection stuff. Right? I can make a connection from the output to error. And I can make a connection from the stimulus to the error, but multiply that by minus one. All right, so now error is going to be the difference between the output and the stimulus. Now what I want to do is I want to say, all right, there's going to be some learning going along here and use this as the error signal. Okay, so first thing I need to do is make sure that this connection here, first of all, that it's learning. So we're going to go back to the line of code that created that connection. We're going to add another parameter, which is learning rule type. And it's the particular learning rule that we're going to use. Um, it's just this, it's this, you know, in the case that we're using it here, it is just the same as delta rule. Um, the reason in Nengo we call this the prescribed error sensitivity rule is things are going to get a little bit more complicated when you do this learning between two groups of neurons. Um, in this particular case, this is exactly the same as standard delta rule. Um, and there is, a, of course, a learning rate parameter. Um, and the default there is uh, 0 0.0001. Uh, let's pull this code back a little bit so we can see it all on the screen. There we are. Um, so there's a learning rate parameter, um, and that's the default. So that's the connection. In order to connect to that, we're going to need some way of referring to this connection. So we're just going to give it a variable name. Um, so fine, we have a connection, and now what we're going to, or we have a thing to connect to, and now we're going to make a connection from the error to C's learning rule. All right, and that's now going to visually be depicted as this green dotted line connected onto that. All right, what the heck is that going to do? I'm going to press save just in case, um, and we're going to run it. All right, I'm feeding in an input of zero right now. The neurons have some activity. My output is zero. The difference between uh, the, the, the output and the, the error, oh, actually we should have pulled up a plot for the error. There we are. Okay, so the error is currently zero. If I go and change that stimulus, ooh, what happened there? Right, let's expand our time a little bit so we can see what the heck happened. All right, I changed our stimulus. All of a sudden, the neural activity changed. Okay. The error started to be kind of large. That error started driving these connection weights to change. It's just delta rule, so it's just uh, the connection weight change is proportional to the activity of the neuron uh, times uh, the error signal. Um, that's going to start changing those connection weights. Our output is going starts growing. So this value, this total output starts growing. Um, eventually it reaches, you know, eventually reaches a point where the error is zero. As you can see, the error starts dropping. Um, and now it has gone ahead um, and learned to output that value. Of course, it is now just sort of overlearned this one particular point. So if I then you know pull this back to zero, you know, no, it came close down to zero, but it didn't, you know, but it had it had overgeneralized, so it didn't all the way drop all the way down to zero. And now it'll go ahead and train back. And now you can do, and then the standard thing that you would now want to do um, when doing some sort of training with this sort of thing is now you want to vary this input up and down. Um, I could do that by just sort of, you know, just moving the slider up and down myself. Um, that's going to get kind of boring and not very repeatable. So what we're going to do is use this as an excuse to this input instead of just setting it to be zero and letting me play with it on a slider um, we're going to go ahead and define a function over time um, and then we're just going to return i don't know a sine wave um, a one hertz sine wave and we say stim func okay so i'm just defining a function it's a function of time it's going to return a value. Nango is just going to call this function every time step and use that for its value. 
Okay, so now the slider's moving up and down. And our output is pretty good. And pretty soon that error starts settling down. Um, and it's sort of learned to produce the output that we want. Of course, I might just I might not want to learn something different than uh, the identity function. Right? Um, and the nice thing with the setup is that's pretty easy. All we need to, if you there's some other function you want to learn, um, there's some input going in here. If you had some sort of external value saying what the correct function or what the correct output was supposed to be given this situation, we could feed that in. Um, in this particular case, what we could also do is just on this connection itself, we could go ahead and say, hey, compute some function on the input. That's the function that you're going to learn. Right. So what we're going to do is from stimulus to error, let's go ahead and define a, da, 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 a new function. I don't know. Uh, we'll call this desired func. Um, now this is a function of x. It's not a function of time. So it's a function of whatever this value is. Okay. Um, and we're just going to say it's going to return x squared. And we're going to say function equals desired function. OK, it should be a little bit weird what's happening here. So this is a new thing that I'm saying that you can do on a connection. You, it's in, in addition to being specified a transform, you can also specify a function. Um, what's going to happen is this stimulus, um, whatever this value is that's coming into this connection, um, it's going to first have this desired function apl uh, applied to it, um, and then have this transform applied to it, and that's going to be the value that's going to come out in the air. Okay. So now, if I use that to compute my error, and let's slow, let's actually slow that down a little bit because I think we're running that pretty quickly. So let's let's do a 0.1 hertz sine wave. Or, oh, maybe that's a little slow. That's probably a little slow. There we are. I just want it to be fast enough so that we can actually see the thing, see what it's learning, see what it's doing. Um, and what we should do is we should be able to slowly see um, that error drop down. Uh, for those of you that are paying attention there, you'll notice the, the graphical update stopped happening here. Um, sometimes in Mango, especially when I'm recording a video, um, there isn't enough processor. It's running as fast as it can. There's enough processor time left to update the, the screen. And so this little slider here at the bottom is controlling how fast the simulation is running. All the way to the right is run as fast as you can. Um, and so I just pulled it back a little bit just to give the processor a little bit time to update the graphics. Um, in any case, uh, what we should now see is as we are moving around this slider, we are now computing the square of the output. You'll notice this is going twice as quickly as that, um, and our error has dropped down pretty close to zero. So it's gone ahead and learned this particular function. So we started with connection weights that were all zero, and then we just used this delta rule supervised learning to go and change those weights. Cool. OK. Um, what else can we do? So, um, so that was all just using Mango just as a general um, neural network package. And uh, right, it's got a particular syntax. It's kind of weird, um, but everything seems is pretty normal. The sort of things that I showed there are the sort of things you should be able to do with any neuron package or any neuron simulator. Now we're going to get into something that's a little bit special with Mango. Um, in that we're trying to be trying to give um, the op an optional thing where you can go to a little bit higher level of abstraction. Okay. And the idea here um, is uh, what's called the neural engineering framework. Um, it's a particular idea about what groups of neurons are good at. 
um, and that's fairly generic across neuron models. Certainly, there's lots of interesting neuron models out there where um, there's really you know special ways of getting them to do particular computations um, that are really specialized to those neuron models. Um, what we're attempting to do here um, is to give give something a little bit more generic. Um, certainly, if you have particular neuron models, you know how to use those ones. Great. Okay, then go ahead and use the sorts of tools I just showed. Um, but here is a sort of a technique that can work across many, many, many different neuron models, um, and is sometimes is what you want. And the only assumptions that we're going to make for this sort of high-level abstraction idea um, is that we have we have neurons. Um, they can be spiking or non-spiking. I don't care. They're just things that can get some inputs and produce some outputs. Um, there, we're also assuming that there are connection weights in order to connect these things together. And we're also going to assume that there are synaptic filters that, such that when a spike happens, um, or even if it's a non-spiking neuron, you know, whenever an output value happens, um, there is something that smooths that information over time. This is a little bit weird. This is this is going to be this is the part, you know the first two statements. I just assume everyone sort of agrees that yes, neurons and connection weights, fine. All right, everybody's happy with that. Um, synaptic filters are pretty common in neuromorphic hardware, um, and um, certainly they're you know quite common in brains. Um, in the extreme, you can set the synaptic filter to be an identity function, so it doesn't exist. So there's in the limit. There's there's that. Um, but a lot of times when a spike happens, it causes input over a period of time. Okay. So we're going to assume that the stuff I'm going to talk about requires those things. Um, and that's pretty generic across lots and lots of neuron models and lots and lots of hardware. It's also, we're going to be making the assumption that we're doing some sort of distributed representation. So the stuff I'm about talking about right now is not the sort of thing where you like, okay, each neuron means something's particular and different. So there's lots of interesting, like there's spiking neuron models of doing path planning where each neuron exactly corresponds to a particular point in space. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about situations closer to what we were just seeing with that learning example, where uh, we were feeding one input into a bunch of neurons and then we were sort of extracting some information out of that. Okay. Um, so this is just for these sorts of cases where there is some sort of distributed representation going on. Again, that's pretty common. So like, you know, deep neural networks have distributed representations. Um, you know, any the, the sort of the standard ways of using neural networks look like that. Um, indeed, this sort of diagram and the sort of idea that neuron neural networks are good at function approximation um, just comes exactly from that, right? So this is, this is sort of a standard single hidden layer neural network. I've got some sort of input I've got some connection weights, I've got some neurons, I've got some connection weights, I've got some output. The only difference between what I'm drawing here and what you might be um, familiar with as a, um, uh, as a sort of single hidden layer neural network is I do not have a nonlinearity at the input and the output. Um, you don't actually need it in order to get the, the standard properties that neural networks are good function approximators. Um, but um, so, Anyway, so just simplifying that out, and that simplification is going to be important in a moment. Um, but yes, just think of this as a standard single hidden layer neural network. I've got a set of connection weights. I've got another set of connection weights, some input, some output. Um, Terminology-wise, we're going to call the input connection weights an encoder, and the output connection weights a decoder. And the idea is, again, it's, we've got some input there's an, that's being encoded into the neural activity. And then in order to get some output from that, we're going to decode from the neural activity, some sort of output. Um, and it should be pretty non-controversial that this sort of thing could be a perfectly good function approximator. Okay. Um, so this is exactly the same diagram as before. I'm sort of writing the math a little bit differently, but the assumption is um, the neural activity, um, instead of drawing individual neurons now, I'm just sort of collapsing it together. Um, the neural activity A is a distributed representation of a vector x. x can be some vector of whatever length. Um, we have some encoding matrix, we have some decoding matrix, um, and we're approximating functions. So this is exactly what I showed in the previous slide. Um, if, we want, if, if you want, you can write out this math that 
um, the activity here is the input. So the input X changing, changes over time, multiplied by some connection weight matrix, um, and then some sort of neuron nonlinearity um, that in this case also includes the gain and the bias of that neuron. Um, that's going to produce the activity. Um, and then if we want to produce, create, figure out some output from that, then all we're doing is taking the activity, multiplying it by the connection weight matrix, adding all that up, that produces our output. Same idea as before. Let's visually depict that a little bit. Um, so here's that idea with four neurons. Okay. Um, feeding in some input. I have some neural activity. In this particular case, they're leaking the great and fire neurons. And at the top here, I'm also plotting the voltage building up. Um, they produce these spikes. This down here is noting that, hey, those spikes, when they come out, there's going to be some sort of synapse involved. Right? And so that each spike is going to produce an output over time. Okay? So that's the low pass filter applied to the spikes. Um, and then we do a weighted sum of these spikes. So that's multiply each of these by the decoder weights. That gives you these. And you add it all up, and you get this. And you will note it looks kind of like, you know, with four neurons, we've got an output that looks kind of like that input. Okay. Um, there is, of course, this open question of how do you get the weights, the decoder weights and the encoder weights. Um, in this particular case, we sort of chose the encoder weights to give us you know, a reasonably diverse set of neuron tuning curves, a diverse set of responses. I'm sorry, this plot up here is if you held the input constant at some sort of value, how fast would each of the neurons fire? So this is just sort of a one standard way of, of visualizing um, what the responses of the neurons are. Um, so if I held the input at zero, or sorry, if I held the input at like 0.5, then this neuron would fire somewhere around, I don't know, 20 hertz, 30 hertz. This neuron would fire at some other rate. This one neuron would fire at some other rate. Um, of course, nothing in this model is assuming anything is, is rate mode. I mean, these are spiking neurons. So that's just, that's just a depiction of what would happen if you held the input constant. Um, so in this particular case, what we've done is we've chosen the encoder weights. Um, and then the question becomes, where do you get these decoder weights? Lots of different ways to get it. One of them would be with the learning rule that I just showed. Um, another way is you can also just treat it as a least squared minimization problem. Find me, find me the weights that will make the sum of these um, outputs look as close as possible to the input, okay. um, or some function of the input. Okay. And indeed, that sort of thing is going to be even more important when we start to go up to 50 neurons. Um, and here with 50 neurons, I've just randomly generated the you know, what sort of responses I want for these neurons. Um, so that's randomly generated the encoder weights and use that solving for the decoder weights. Um, and now you can see, hey, look, yeah, you can make that output look pretty much like that input or like some function of that input. Right? So again, those are just multiple ways of depicting exactly the same thing. And it is just a standard hidden layer, a single hidden layer neural network. It's a little weird that I'm using spiking neurons in the middle of a hidden layer whatever, it doesn't really change any of the underlying assumptions. Okay, let's go build that in Nango. We're back here, we're gonna make a new example, call this example three. And we're gonna go ahead and delete everything. Oop. So, um, I'm gonna have this some stimulus. I'm going to have a group of neurons. Sure, we'll call them A. There's, I don't know, 50 of them. Dimensions is one because I'm feeding one value into all into them. And I'm just going to make that connection from stim to A. Okay. So that's just going to feed in the input. Um, Let's go ahead and make some sort of output place for them. Node does nothing. Um, this is somewhat similar to the learning example we just did, but I'm going to write this now. What did that do? So first of all, this is different than what we showed before when I did an a dot neurons and then connected to output and then I specified a 
100 by or 50 by one uh, weight matrix. Um, I'm not because I'm not referring to dot neurons. Um, so if I referred to dot neurons, then I would be doing the sort of manually connect things up, specify your own connection weights. Um, I'm not this case. I'm just saying go from A to output. And A, this is 50 neurons here in A. Go to output. What what is Nenga gonna do for figuring out what that connection weights are? What it's gonna do is it's going to find the connection weights that best approximate some function. And the particular function that it's going to assume is because I haven't specified it. It's going to assume the identity function, right? So I could have said this. Okay. So this is back to, I mean, I was indicating when you when you specify a connection, you can specify a function. In this case, when that function is coming out of a group of neurons, instead of that function being something that Nengo is just going to go ahead and compute every time step, so that's what happened when we had that function come out of the stimulus and go to the error. Instead, what it's going to do is, well, hold on a second. You wanted these as neurons. Fine. Okay. I'm going to find the connection weights along here that do the best job of approximating this function. Okay. So it's when I when I press play down here, it's going to go ahead and train up a single, simple little single hidden layer neural network. Um, so we've got this input that's one value coming in. We've got encoders that are passing that up to these 50 neurons. Um, I've got, uh, and then I've got the set of connection weights coming out of that. It's going to go ahead and find the best weights for that. And if I'm just going to go ahead and do that. So you notice when I press play, that little gear sort of spun for a little while. That was it doing that optimizing. Right. And now, oops, why did that input not do anything? I'm going to make that go away. Give me a new slider. Let's make sure what happened there. There we are. Okay, so there's no learning going on. Like, so there was learning happening when I press play because it went ahead and did some optimizing and found connection weights. Connection weights are not changing after that fact. Right? And now what we've got is we've got a system where if I go ahead and feed in 0.6, I'm going to get an output of about 0.6. Okay, so it's gone ahead and found those connection weights. Okay, um, so. What does that mean? So this is sort of, this is what I mean about this sort of, we're giving a slightly higher level of abstraction right now. Cause I'm like, I just, it just, I don't want to be worried about the details about how all those connection weights got found. Just go ahead and do that. Right? Um, certainly there's going to be some interesting properties here. Like if I drop down the number of neurons, so I've only got 10 neurons, right? It's going to be much noisier okay? or much less accurate. Um, Again, it's part of this noise is just because we're using leaky integrate fire neurons. Um, if I have more of these, I don't know, let's go up to 500 neurons. Okay, that's going to be really quite accurate. A couple things to keep in mind here. Uh, so, all right, before we go any further that, because it's just optimizing to find some function, we can go ahead and change what that desired function is. So, all right, here we go. Please compute x squared. Okay, now, all right, I feed in a one, I get out a one. I feed in a zero, I get a zero. I feed in a minus one, I get a one. Okay. So it's gone ahead and found the connection weights that approximate x squared. And I can put in any function I feel like in there. All right. Um, Yes, I can go ahead and go ahead and approximate any function. One important thing to keep in mind, um, and this will sort of end up coming up now and then throughout this lecture, is that um, when it does that optimization, there's going to be some question about what's the range that that's optimizing over. So this slider here at the moment goes between minus one and one. What happens if I change that range? What if I change it to minus two to two? Right. As far as the neurons go, I mean, it's all like nothing magic is going to happen here. It's just I'm going to mean a bigger value is being fed into my neural network, right? So neurons are they're just going to spike more or less or something's going to happen. Um, and what's going to happen? Well, I'm feeding in a two. I'm getting out. Oh, well, this 
that line is now above my graph, so I'm going to have to right click on this graph, set its range, minus 2 to 2. All right, so now what am I getting here? All right, I'm feeding in a 2, I'm getting at 1.3. That's just wrong, right? That's not 2 squared. What happened? What happened is that when it did it, it's optimizing. Well, two things are happening. Um, it's assuming things between minus one and one. And what that means, that means two things. One thing it says, hey, when I do that optimizing and finding connection weights, only optimize across this range. So that's one thing that's happening. The other thing that's happening is when it randomly generates the gains and biases of these neurons, right? Um, it's setting them up such that they have um, such that the range of sort of typical activity um, is uh, between minus one and one. So what do we mean by that? If I, if I right click on A and I say details and I go to plots, this is sort of again that similar depiction of well what happens to these neurons with different inputs and what this is saying is hey look so each of these lines is a different neuron um, and this is, again, the randomly generated gains and biases such that they get this sort of distribution. Okay, um, And you can change these ranges and whatnot. Um, but the idea is, if you start giving in inputs that are off the side of this graph, well, pretty much all that's happening is that these neurons are just going to go and you know increase their activity more. Um, but there isn't going to be any sort of new neurons that start firing or stop firing. So there aren't going to be very many nonlinearities outside of this range. And so it's not going to be very good at um, dealing with functions in that uh, out there out in that sort of with those sorts of inputs. Um, so one, th so there's two things that need to happen in order to get this better at a wider range of things. One of them is we need to adjust the um, gains and biases of these neurons such that they're good across a wider range. And the other thing we have to do is when we do the optimization, uh, we need to uh, optimize across. Um, a wider range of inputs. Okay. Fortunately, those two things are tied together in one parameter in Mango, um, and that parameter is radius. Whoops, I have to spell radius correctly. So that's saying, no, why is it radius? It's radius because this is going to need to generalize to higher dimensions. In one dimension, the radius is just sort of, okay, a radius of one means values between minus one and one. Uh, and a radius of 2 is values between minus 2 and 2. Um, so that's going to make that change. That's going to do everything that we wanted. And now I'm going to press play. Um, and now what should happen if I go move that slider up to... Oh, <laughs> of course, an input of 2 is now outside of this graph. I'm going to right-click on this and say, I don't know, 0 to 4, because that's going to be my range of inputs. By feeding in a 2, I'm going to value out eh, it's slightly below 4. I might want to increase my numbers of neurons. But the idea is going to be that it's now going to be much better across that range. All right. Um, so that has introduced the, oh, actually, I guess I did both of our examples there. One of them was playing around with radius, and the other one was playing around with uh, different desired functions. Okay. Excellent. Um, so as I was saying with that radius thing, um, inputs can be more than one value. Um, that's why we call it a radius, because it's more sort of, okay, my inputs are in some circle of some radius or some sphere of some radius or some hypersphere. Um, you can also manually specify your own distributions, but those are much easier. Um, and the same sort, but exactly the same sort of thing is going to work in multiple dimensions. There's nothing special about one dimension. So let's go ahead and show that. Let's go up to, all right, just get my numbering right. I'm jump up to an example five. Um, and my idea here is we're going to do multiple dimensions as our inputs. So I'm going to have an input that is 0, 0. I'm going to set my number of dimensions of my group of neurons to 2. Um, we're going to have some output that is, say, also two values. Um, and let's, let's start with the identity function. So if you don't specify a function, it assumes the identity function. And now we're going to have a stimulus 
an A and an output. Those are neurons, those are output, those are stimulus. Um, you'll now notice there are two sliders because there's two inputs. That's good. Um, we haven't specified what function to do, so it's going to go ahead and attempt the identity function. Okay. Oh, and it would help if this graph is between minus one and one. Here we are. Okay, so now we have inputs. So as we, oh, I suppose this range should also be between minus one and one. Here we are. Okay, as I go ahead and play with these and play with these. Um, so the important thing to keep in mind here is, yes, these two values are being fed into these neurons. Um, the output is just two different decodings out of these neurons, because again, it's just a standard hidden layer neural network. One set of weights is giving one value, another set of weights is giving the other value. Okay, and we can go ahead and represent things. If I try to represent the value 1, 1, it's not going to do a great job of that. Why is that? Because my default radius is 1, and the, and the point 1, 1 is well outside of the circle of radius 1. So, all right, if I really want to represent everything in that range, I could set the radius to be something like 1.5, or I suppose square root 2. Um, but now it's pretty good at representing values up to that point 1, 1. All right, um, so we can do that. Um, we can also, you can also play around with all, so yes, there's all sorts of default um, optimizations or sort of default sampling across um, a, a unit sphere to be the, um, to get these sorts of, uh, to do that optimization, you can go ahead and configure that. Um, one, um, yeah, and certainly if you go ahead and define some sort of function in here, so my desired function, um, I'll just do the x squared again. No, so if you can specify that function if you want. So now it's doing some other thing. Right, and then you could go ahead and stare at that and say, okay, yes, it is doing what you want. Um, this, of course, could be some function that combines them. You know, this is just any arbitrary function. I mean, I could do x0 times x1 as one value, and then, I don't know, x1 uh, minus x0 as another one, and then, I don't know, uh, x, uh, just x0 as another one. Okay, but that would be three values, so that would mean that my output would now need to be three-dimensional. Right. That's going to work there. Um, and now it's just going to go ahead and decode out all of those functions. Okay. Now, um, I wanted, so one interesting variant of what we just talked about there, I'm going to go on to example six. Um, this function thing that I'm defining here, what the heck, like, you don't always have some sort of closed form, this is the function I want you to approximate. Sometimes you just have a bunch of data and say, hey, look, here's I've got some input and output data. Indeed, that's sort of the more typical thing that you would do with a neural network. Here I have a bunch of input output data. Um, and indeed, what Nengo is actually doing under the hood when I give it this function is it actually goes ahead, when I press play down there, is it goes ahead and randomly samples this function. It generates a whole bunch of X values, runs this function on them, gets those desired outputs, um, and then does its optimization um, to find the, the connection weights that best do that. But if I have a bunch of data, then I should be able to just give it that data. Right? So let's use this as an opportunity to just go ahead and do cla the classic XOR problem. Right? So if my, um, so what I'm gonna have is, so my inputs, so if I have a list of inputs, all right, um, and um, just because I like values between minus one and one, um, we're going to do the XOR value problem with a range of minus one and one. Um, so one input is one, one, another input is one minus one, another one is minus one, one, and another one is minus one, minus one. All right, there's some input data. Uh, our outputs. 
for the first one, I would like a 1 as the output. For the next one, I want a minus 1 as the output. For the next one, I want a minus 1 as an output. For the next one, I want a 1 as an output. Right? That's x. That's xor only using 1s and minus 1s instead of 1s and zeros. Um, if you have data like that, then instead of specifying the function equals, well, what you end up doing is you say function equals outputs. So those are the actual outputs. But then you're also going to need to specify, well, what are the evaluation points? What are the points that we're supposed to be evaluating this function at that are supposed to correspond to those output values? Um, and that's exactly what this is, is eval points equals inputs. Okay. Uh, oh, and now we're still getting an error. That's because, hey, something is of shape 3. Why is that of shape 3? Oh, because this output is still defined to be three values. We want one value. Okay. So this is just an example of I have data. Go ahead and do the optimization on that data instead of specifying a function. Go ahead and press play. Um, and now I should have a system where if I feed in 1, 1. Uh -huh. Let's pull this. Nice. I got caught in a error that I didn't quite expect. Good. So first of all, it overall kind of does what I want, right? Minus 1, 1. I get out, eh, it's not quite minus 1. Minus one, one, one. So it's doing the task, but not quite. Why is it not quite? Well, if the radius was one, it might actually be better at this task. One, minus one. Now it's much better at that task. Why? What's going on here? Because I forgot to tell you something. When special, and this is actually something that I often forget when I'm going ahead and uh, specifying connection weights. Um, so it's, I'm very glad it came up here. Um, when you specify your own eval points, um, also set this parameter, scale eval points equals false. What's this parameter? By default, the inputs get scaled by whatever the radius is. Because if you set the radius to be 20, you want to train it over that the sphere of radius 20. Um, so if you're manually specifying things, you don't want it to be doing that scaling. Um, so all right. So make sure when you're manually specifying things to set the scale eval points equals false. Important safety tip. Um, and now, whoops, now that should work, even if the radius is something different. Now doing perfectly good XOR. Okay. You will, of course, notice that it's doing something in between, like with those inputs that are in the middle. Right? Those are inputs that, that the system had never been told to do anything on. It does something. It was never optimized on those points. Um, generally, it'll do something vaguely realist, vaguely OK. Um, that all depends on what the optimization approach is, of course. But with uh, least squared minimization, it tends to be pretty well behaved. Cool. All right, so that's the sort of basic component with this high-level abstraction. And hopefully you can also sort of see that everything I'm talking there was really agnostic to the neuron model. So even if I'm like, so if I have something where I'm like, all right, I want to compute x squared. And if I compile that down to run on a, you know, a leaky integrate and fire neuron model on some hardware, or I compile it down to run on rectified linear units on some other hardware, um, those are going to use wildly different connection weights. But the, this abstraction that Nango is presenting to me is, I, I don't care what connection weights it's ending up doing. Just go ahead and make that process happen and do whatever optimization and find whatever connection weights is right for the hardware that you're running on. Okay, so that's, that's what we mean by having this higher level of abstraction. Um, and fine, you can use that to sort of build one component. Um, but if we're sort of building large systems, we might want to do a bunch of those, and we might want to sort of connect them up with each other. And to a certain degree, this connecting up is actually is, is sort of really quite obvious. Like, you know, if I have, say, one function being computed here, y is some function of x, and z is some function of y, and I just want to sort of feed one into the other, so I go compute one function, take the result, feed it into the other, well, that's just easy, right? You just chain these things. Um, and on some hardware, that's great. That's fine. That's exactly what you want to do. Um, 
on some har on other hardware, um, and in particular on like biology, well, you can't do this, right? Like biology doesn't have a group of neurons going ahead and connected to some intermediate thing, and then those are all then it and connect to another group of neurons. Um, what would be more typical is um, having some sort of connection weight matrix that goes all from all of A to all of B, right? And so if I wanted to have a sort of a connection weight matrix, if I wanted to get rid of this intermediate thing, right? Because I mean, I'm defining this intermediate thing in terms of these, you know, this is one neural network of the type that we just talked about. And this over here is another neural network of the type we just talked about. Um, we can go ahead and do all these optimizations separately. Like, you know, if, if I'm def making network to do one function, I can just train that up and do another network that does this other function, and then I'm just combining them together. But if I now want to get rid of this Y thing in the middle, well, because I did specify that these Y things don't have a nonlinearity, so this is linear, and D is linear, these two matrices are just linear operations, that means I can just combine those things, right? I can just take those two weight matrices. So this D weight matrix um, was sort of the thing that, you know, when we did the training of this other neural network, we got this set of connection weights. Um, and in this particular case, we were sort of randomly generating these E values, but we could also have been doing something like backprop that would sort of learn both of these. But then if we want to connect these two, two things together, and if we're on hardware that requires us to just have some one weight matrix between them, right, then we can just multiply these two mat matrices together and we get the weight matrix between them that does exactly the same thing. Okay. That's a little bit weird. Right? Um, and whether you whether or not you want to do that, it sort of it depends on, you know, certainly when I do things that I'm trying to match to biology, then yes, I do that multiplication because biology would have these sorts of weights. Um, uh, but importantly, these two things are mathematically identical, right? So really, which one you do just depends on the um, what hardware you're running on, which of these two is more optimal. Um, I will note that on a lot of hardware, this is a lot more optimal because, or a lot more efficient. Um, because uh, you're using much less memory, right? Because the, the weight matrix, this is a, you know, this will be something like a one by 100 matrix. This will be a 100 by one matrix. Um, but if I multiply them together, then it'll be a 100 by 100 matrix, All right? So this, this is a much larger um, uh, matrix. Um, so, but again, that just becomes an efficiency calculation. You know, what's the best way to implement it? Um, and some hardware, only supports that, so then you've only got one option. Cool. Um, but conceptually, I think about it this way, um, but we just sort of keep track of the fact that this mapping exists. All right, let's do some quick examples of that. Um, all right. Example seven. Um, let's start fresh again. So stim is some um, node. Yes, I've written this code a lot of times. Um, and then we're going to have A is some ensemble. One value. B is some other thing. Hundred mentions is one. I'm gonna make a connection from stem to A. Uh, I'm gonna make a connection from A to B, and here I'm gonna ask it to go compute some function. I'm gonna say def. Uh, uh, I don't know my function. Uh, all right, I'm sick of x squared, so let's do. I don't know, uh, negative x plus 0.5, some function. Right. Function equals my func. Okay. Um, I'm making this connection right straight from A to B, so I didn't have to make that intermediate output thing. Um, and now it's entirely up to Nengo how it wants to go ahead and run this the most efficiently it will be, um, since I'm right now, I'm running it on my CPU. Um, the most efficient thing is going to be for it to sort of create that intermediate node and do the, the two separate multiplications, but computationally, the result will be the same any either way. 
Um, I'm also going to show some interesting shortcuts now. Instead of creating that output node, um, if you right click on a group of neurons and just say value, right click on this and say value, um, that's going to sort of behind the scenes create one of those output nodes, have it decode out the uh, value function. Um, so you basically you always have access to just give me the identity function um, uh, from these two things. So what should happen now is this input is going to come into this group of neurons. This graph is going to be sort of decoding out the identity function. This graph is going to be decoding out the identity function from here. But this connection from here to here is computing this function negative x plus 0.5. Okay, go ahead and run that. All right, I'm feeding in 0. This group of neurons is outputting 0. All right. This one is representing 0.5. Cool, that's right. Negative 0 plus 0.5 is that. And if I go ahead and change my inputs, I don't know why that's not working. Remove that, make a new slider. All right, don't know why that's... Oh, but if I set that at 1, this group of neurons is representing a 1. This group of neurons is representing you know, something that's hmm, not quite as close as I wanted. If I want it to be better, um, if I want to be this to be better at that, then I might increase the number of neurons. All depends on what it is um, that I want the system to. You know, all depends on how much accuracy I need. Okay. Oh right, yes. Of course, if I feed in minus one, this group of neurons is going to be representing minus one. I, you know, this is just still just showing the actual activity. So again. This, value, this plot value here is a decoded representation of the actual activity in those neurons. Right. But this is so the, the neural activity is actually what's happening. Same thing is going on over here. If I made those spikes graphs, we do that. Yay. Right. But most of the time I find that I don't bring up these plots because you know, really what I'm interested in is what's being represented. Okay. Um, as I was saying, if I feed in a value of minus one, ideally this group of neurons would now be representing um, 1.5. It's not, it's representing one point a little bit. That's again because this group of neurons B has a default radius of one. If I wanted to go ahead and change that, I could go ahead and change that and say, I don't know, radius equals 1.5. And now that will go ahead and change that. And then now we're getting values around the right range. Cool. So we can go ahead and connect things up like that. What are some other things that we could do? Um, all right, we can do that. What about adding two numbers? that are represented in two groups of different groups of neurons. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's go ahead and do example eight. Okay, so I've got one input that is say going to one group of neurons. I'm just gonna copy this, paste in B, B. I'm gonna make some connections from stem A to A and from stem B to B. And I don't know, C is some other ensemble. And I'm just going to do this. I'm going to connect A to C. And I'm going to connect B to C. This is now a big mess over here on the left. I'm going to right click over here and say auto layout. And it's going to go ahead and make things a little bit nicer. I'm going to remove some of these plots because I don't need them anymore. Um, we'll say put the A here, put the B here. Oh, let's change the range on this thing to minus one to one. Uh, and pull up a value plot on that. Slider, slider. Very glad this is being recorded so people can slow down the video or play that a few times to make sure that you're following all the things that I was doing. All right, what have I done here? So 
this is this should just be computing an identity function. This should be computing an identity function. But now we've got this new thing where we've got inputs. We've got two sets of inputs going to the same group of neurons. What's that going to do? Well, we know what that's going to. So all that's going to do is the actual current going being fed into each of these neurons. So to the inputs, each of these neurons is just going to be the sum of the inputs that are being fed into it. Okay, so that's just the um, how Mengo is just going to, if you have multiple inputs coming in, it's just the sum. And that's true at the sort of the neuron level, um, but because of the linearity of every, all the different steps that are happening inside this connection, it's also true at the representation level. Right? So it's also going to mean that if I feed in 1 and minus 1, I'm going to get a 0 being represented here. If I feed in, I don't know, 0.43 and 0.47, then I'm going to get a 1 out here. Okay. So this system is going to add things. Right. And again, if I go outside of the range, if I go outside the radius, then it's not going to do a good job, but whatever. We know how to fix that with the radius. So if you do multiple inputs into a group of neurons, it's going to end up representing the sum of those inputs. Fine. What if I want to do something else here? Groups of neurons can represent more than one thing, what if I want this group of neurons to represent a comma b? I want it to represent a two-dimensional thing, which is the two things being fed into it. Right? All that should be is just a different set of connection weights between b and c and a and c. Right? Um, how are we going to get it to, to do that? Well, first thing we're going to do is c is going to now going to need to be two-dimensional. The moment I change C to be two-dimensional, now Mango says, hold on a second, this connection here doesn't make any sense anymore because you've got a one-dimensional value being sent into two-dimensional things. Okay, what can we do with that? We know when we specify a connection, so what I really want is I want A to affect the first dimension of C, and I want B to represent the second dimension of C. So I know that when I make connections, I'm allowed to specify a function. The one thing I could do is I could say this function, this is going to be a kind of a weird function, but it's still a function. I want it to return x0, comma 0. And I'm going to do a similar trick uh, for the b function. Maybe 0, comma x0. Okay, so first of all, stare at that for a moment and sort of see, okay, does that make sense, right? So I said, like, I, told, I said when you make a connection, you have a neural network that approximates any function you want. That's a function. It's a weird function. It's a function that takes in one value and outputs that same value and a zero, but it's a legit function. Um, and what that should do, and then since this input here is now going to get the sum of these two things, that's what it's going to end up representing, then it should make sense that this is going to now represent a comma b. Nothing weird. So this is all just sort of implications of what I've been showing so far, of just this idea of chaining together functions. Um, and under, so there's there's nothing special under the hood for handling these sorts of cases. It's all just okay. I'll just go ahead and approximate those functions, find connection weights that approximate functions, and go ahead and do things. Um, but that is the sort of thing that we would get out of it. All right. And now when I go ahead and run that, um, now c instead of representing the sum of a and b, is representing both values. Right? The actual structure of the system has not changed. The only thing that's changed is the connection weights um, along these lines. Because this sort of thing is a fairly common, uh, comes up fairly commonly, that I want to sort of combine things like that, we have introduced special syntax in Nengo to make it faster to encode something, to write something like that. Um, and here's that syntax. What I do is I say I want to go from A to C0. Um, and I want to go from B to C1. I'll just comment out those. Okay, so those are, in terms of what's happening under the hood, those are identical. All right, um, you know, we'll end up with the same connection weights and whatnot. Um, but this is just sort of syntactic sugar, just to sort of make it quick and easy to write something like that. 
All right, and so we're indexing into C, and of course that means something very different than what we showed before of C neuron zero. That would be saying, hey, connect to the first neuron in C and don't connect to any of the others, um, which might be what you want. So in those situations, you can do that. But what we want here is we're still connecting to all of these neurons, all right? But we're finding the connection weights that will conceptually represent the output, the combination of the two things. All right, so we showed sort of two, two, so we showed addition, one way to combine things. We showed this sort of combination, another way to write, combine things. What about multiplication? I'm gonna, so let's, what if I wanna multiply A and B, all right? Um, and multiplying A and B, that would be fine if there was the same group of neurons representing both of them, but like, this, if, if I have this situation where this is representing, this group of neurons is representing A and this group of neurons is representing B and I want to do the product between A and B, how, how do I specify that, right? How do I make a connection from A to C, to C such that the value of that function is like some product of two different things? It just like, it doesn't seem to fit with the syntax that we've shown here. Um, and indeed, there's a reason it doesn't fit with the syntax we showed here is that it turns out if you try to do that optimization, if you try to do the optimization of finding these connection weights, um, like just optimizing these connection weights such that C is a nonlinear function of these two things, um, it goes badly. It, it's, it's hard to do that approximation. Um, although there's some very cool things you can do to actually somewhat do that approximation if you have a more complex neuron model. Take a look at some of the... Um, um, recent things that uh, Andreas Stock, uh, Stockel has done with um, the Nango Bio library. So there are some cool things if you do a more complex neuron model. Um, but for the vast majority of simple neuron models, um, you just can't do a particularly good job of that function. But if you do want to multiply A and B, um, now that we know this trick of making a group of neurons that represents the combination of A and B, well, now I can do it fine, right? I could just make another group of neurons, make an ensemble dimensions is one, and just go ahead and make a connection from C to D, where the function is the product, whoops, which I suppose I also have to define. Right. Def product x turn x0 times x1. And we're starting to get too much code here, so let's go and delete this and that so we can actually see everything. All right. So if I do want to compute some nonlinear function of these two, then what I've done here is I've built this intermediate layer that lets me do that. And now what you should find is we should be getting a little bit of a product going on here. One times one is not one. Why is that the case? Vast majority of the time when, uh, when we have a problem like that, the answer is, oh, right, we've done something wrong with the radius. Of course, this group of neurons here, we currently have as a radius of one because we haven't specified it. So that means it's actually representing smaller numbers. You multiply those smaller numbers together and yeah, we're gonna get something even smaller. So that's wrong. So that means we need to increase the radius of that group of neurons. And now we're getting much more like multiplication. Okay. Cool. All right, so we've just shown a bunch of stuff of doing sort of these sorts of just doing computations. I want to spend a little bit time now talking about time. And because there's something, I mean, yes, these groups of these neural groups are doing a good job of approximating functions, but you haven't really talked about how quickly they're doing it. Okay. And in particular, when we have groups of neurons, if there are these sorts of postsynaptic currents or any sort of this sort of temporal response type thing happening. Um, it turns out that if you ask these systems to approximate some function, again, because everything is linear in here, 
um, you know, the connection weights, synapses, more connection weights, all those things are, are, are to a reasonable approximation linear. Um, what that's going to mean is that if we think about things in terms of what the function is that's being computed, um, if there are all these synapses at the sort of the, the neuron level that are happening with some sort of time constants, um, that's going to mean that the overall function is going to get smoothed by that. Okay, um, so this is the convolution, you know, the convolution operator um, that might be familiar to those doing engineering. Um, what what does this practically mean? Okay, so what this practically means, example eleven. Um, let's go back. Let's go back to our really simple example. We have a stimulus. We have another group of neurons. We're going to just connect from A to B, and, or from stim to A, and then from A to B, and we're going to get rid of all this. All right. And I haven't specified what function to do, so it's going to be assuming the identity function. All right. So this is now an example that we've seen many times before. I'm going to press play. Yay. Look. Inputs. Things are changing. Right. Fine. It's doing a perfectly good job of passing information around. I'm going to pause the simulation. I'm going to change the input quickly. Well, that's interesting. It didn't go immediately down. It did some sort of... That looks a heck of a lot like an exponential decay, doesn't that? That looks... Huh. Right? And that's exactly what's happening here. This is what I was meaning by we're getting some sort of computation, um, some sort of smoothing happening just because of the synapse. Right. And if I did some sort of, say, really long synapse, again, the default is 5 milliseconds. But if I, say, had a 100 millisecond synapse in there, so it would be a 100 millisecond low-pass filter. Okay. Right. Nothing has changed about the connection weights. I haven't changed anything at all about the connection weights. The only thing I've changed is when those spikes happen, how much time are they smoothed over? over. Right. And now... We're getting, you know, we're getting a, a smoothing over a much longer period of time. Right? And for those that have seen this sort of thing before, this is a low-pass filter. Right? If I go ahead and change my input with a high frequency, I get a very low frequency output. Right? This is exactly why an engineer would put in something like that, is you can get low-pass, is you can, you know, get sort of smoothing behaviors over time. So that's something that we get sort of for free because we have these synapses at the neuron level and because connection weights, you know, all just add up, um, then you get this sort of overall effect of, oh, okay, I've asked it to compute some function, but I'm actually getting that function um, with some low-pass filter applied to it. All right, cool. All right, that might be what you want. But there's something a little bit weird that can now happen. Because you notice all the examples I've done so far we're kind of feed forward. What if I do some recurrence? What if I connect this group of neurons back to itself using exactly the same sorts of things that I've said so far? All right. So what if I say, um, well, let's first of all let's put the synapse back to where it was. But what if I say um, a connection from B to B? All right. Well, I've got to specify some function. The default function was the identity function, but let's do something else. Diff, uh, recurrent. So let's say I say return x plus 1. Okay. Nothing special is happening here. I, like, so I'm just saying just do exactly the same computations that we've been doing for making these feedforward connections. Just apply exactly the same thing. It just happens to be from one group of neurons back to themselves. It doesn't change any of the calculations. It just says, okay, I'll go ahead and find connection weights that'll go and approximate this function, and I'll build a big connection weight matrix by combining this decoder, the decoder that approximates this function with the encoder that these groups of neurons are using. All right, but what's, what's it going to do? Oh, let's run it and find out. So I feed in a zero, and what happens? Oh, it shoots up really quickly. Of course, that kind of makes sense, right? I'm feeding in a zero. You know, overall, the effect of this recurrent connection is if this is representing a zero, then it's going to be feeding back a value of one. 
this group of neurons is now going to be representing one plus zero. That's going to make it shoot up. Now this is going to go again, and so it's going to keep representing a larger and larger and larger value. We're going to hit some sort of saturation just because the neurons have a radius of one. So they're only optimized across some range and it's going to just sort of flatten out at some point. But how did, what controlled how quickly this shot up? Right. What, what, what's adjusting that? How, if we wanted it to change how quickly it shot up, how could we do that? Well, one thing we could do is we could change this function that we're approximating. Right. We're going to say 0.1. Right. Now what's it going to do? Shoots up a lot more smooth, you know. Well, actually, you know, it seems like really kind of a straight line there. That kind of makes sense. So that's one thing we could have done to adjust how quickly it shoots up. What's, what else could we have done? Well, there's also the synapse, which defaulted to that. Um, let's say I increase that synapse time constant. Hmm. That also slows down this increase. All right, that sort of vaguely makes some sort of intuitive sense. It'd be nice if we had some sort of mathematical framework to really understand what the hell's going on there, but we sort of vaguely have an idea on that. Okay, that's fine. What if we play around with another function? What if I play around with that function? Okay, so all I'm doing is changing the connection weights on this recurrent connection again. Now what's it going to do? Okay, if I feed in a zero, I get out a zero. That kind of makes sense. Zero feeds in, zero comes out, zero feeds back around, zero plus zero is zero, zero everything's fine. I feed in a one, I get out a 0.5. What? Right. I feed in a 1. This is currently representing 0.5. So this value coming out here is going to be minus 0.5. Minus 0.5 plus 1 is going to be 0.5. So that's all going to be stable. All right. So that we can sort of... All right. It kind of makes sense that that's what it stabilizes out to. It wasn't intuitively obvious initially. Um, although we could have realized that if we had have said something like... Um, well, B is the value being represented by B. So just sort of, if we had wanted to do some math here, we could have said the value represented by B is going to be the negative of the value represented by B plus A, right? So that's the negative. So the negative of B is this, A is coming in here. And then if we went ahead and solved that, right? So if we know, well, yeah, if we went ahead and solved that, we could say, what is that? That's two B uh, is A. And then we could say B is going to be A divided by 2. All right, that's going to be where those things all, that's the only place where that's going to balance out. All right, so that's going to mean, yeah, if I feed in minus 1, I get that. Feed in 1, I get that. All right, okay, so we can sort of can understand why it's doing this. But hold on a second. When I change that input quickly, why, why, why did it do that? What's, what's going on here? Now, why why this? So, like, something weird is happening here. We can sort of vaguely understand what's going on given the components we've going on, but and, and we haven't added anything new here. I mean, I'm building these models just, just using exactly the stuff that I was showing before. Um, so something, um, we need to get some sort of interesting understanding about what's going on at this point here. Okay, one more example. Uh, x squared. Okay. And what if I feed in x squared? All right, if I feed in zero, I get out of zero. Fine, that's pretty boring. That makes sense. I feed in a larger value. All right, I get some sort of large value out. Smaller value. All right, I could vaguely make sense of that. I'm feeding in a zero, I'm getting out, or feeding in a small value, I'm getting out a small value. Feed in a big value, get out a big value. Pull back down to that small value. Hold on a second. I'm feeding in point 0.2, I'm getting a large value out. I go down, feed in point 0.2 again, I'm getting a smaller value out. This system now has memory. Right. This is, this is you know, this is you know, storing a, at least a bit of information. Right. Right. The input. 
because, I mean, this is the whole point of having recurrent connections, right? Is that you can now have systems that are, uh, their outputs are some function of their past history. Um, and here we have a situation that's really nice, quite and stable um, and is able to store information. And that's something we couldn't do with the sort of just the feed forward connections we're going on so far. So like something new is here, let's try to understand it a little bit. Okay, so we've kind of just done played around by hand a little bit. Um, let's, turns out we can actually mathematically understand what the hell's going on here. All right, um, and this is sort of the interesting math behind the neural engineering framework that lets us build a large range of things or a surprising set of things out of the components that I just described. Because so far I've just sort of said, hey, feed forward connections, neural networks can approximate functions. And pretty much everything that I showed so far is sort of kind of weird consequences of that, but all right, fine, you're just using neural networks to approximate functions. This is a little bit of extra where we're gonna show one new thing you can do um, if you have the sorts of components we've been talking about, which is neurons, synapses, and uh, and some, or yeah, neurons, connection weights, and synapses. Um, and what is that new thing? Well, all right, so here let's just depict what we're doing here. So the feed forward situation with a single neural network and then a recurrent connect or single neural network is, and, and I'm, I'm approximating that network to approximate some function. I'm feeding in X, I'm getting something that computes some function of X. Um, but as I commented, there's that low pass filter um, caused by the synapse. All right. Um, so we're assuming in this diagram that the, the neural network is approximating the function perfectly. Um, and the only thing that's a little bit weird is, oh, and we have some sort of temporal influence going on here. And so this is just that depiction of exactly what we're showing. Um, yeah. And now in our new situation, what we want is we're adding in this recurrent connection that's computing some other function. Right? And math wise, okay, fine. Now Y is just gonna be, H of T, that's our low pass filter, that's our synapse model, um, or some other synapse model if you don't, if you want something more complex than a low pass filter. Um, and then you've got some function of the input and some function of the recurrent thing, right? So I've got some recurrent function and some feed forward function, and I can specify those functions to be anything I want, right? Because that's when I make the connection, this is the function that I want them to approximate. And so now the question is, what does that equation mean, right? Um, how do I solve that equation? What is Y going to do given a particular choice of G and F and X? Um, for some of you, you'll look at that and hey, oh, it's really obvious what you should do. Um, for others of us, um, what we do is we take that equation and we find our nearest mathematician and we ask them what we should do. Um, and that mathematician says, look, convolution is a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, get rid of it. And the way you get rid of it is by doing some sort of transformation. Um, and the transformation that should jump to mind right now is the Laplace transform. And the reason the Laplace transform should jump to mind is this little shape here um, is one of the shapes that in the back of your engineering textbook or math textbook, um, it will it gives you what the Laplace transform of that shape is. Laplace transform of that shape is one over one plus S tau. Um, all right, so what's that gonna mean? Uh, so we do a Laplace transform. We know the Laplace transform of this thing. Um, it's slightly more complicated with a more complicated um, synapse model, but similar trick is gonna happen. Convolution turns into multiplication, um, and then we just have the transform of whatever these functions are. Why do we do that? Well, now we can do just grade school algebra, rearrange things a little bit, um, pull this SY over on this side. Why do we pull the SY on this side? Well, Laplace SY has a really nice inverse Laplace transform, which is the derivative. So that's the solution to this, that you know, dy dt is going to be this. So this is how y is gonna change over time, given the functions that we've specified. And this tau is the time constant of that synapse. Okay. Importantly, what this means is that if I have some differential equation I really want to approximate, then I just set my recurrent connection to be the part of that differential equation that's about y multiplied by tau plus y. And I set my, my input feed forward connection to being tau times um, the part of the, the 
the differential equations, but x. Um, with the change of variables, you can do arbitrary functions of x and y as well. But, um, for simplicity, this will cover most cases. Um, but this is, so this says, using exactly the tools I've just described, which is something you should be able to do on any sort of neuromorphic hardware, um, now all of a sudden, instead of just using neurons to approximate functions, now I can use neurons to approximate differential equations. That seems to be, that opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. All right, so that's sort of, um, to me, that's sort of this, this thing you get for free the moment you have neurons able to approximate functions and you have synapses, um, you're all of a sudden able to approximate differential equations as well. Cool, so what's some examples of that? Um, well, one example would be um, implementing um, different longer time constant low pass filters. So one thing that certainly when in analog hardware and sometimes in digital hardware as well, when you're implementing a low pass filter, you've got to change some range of um, uh, yeah, some range of your synapse model. But what if you want the overall system to have a much longer time constant? Okay, the nice thing is there's a differential equation for a low-pass filter. So let's go ahead and get neurons to approximate this differential equation. All right, I guess we're up to example 12. So what do we mean by that? Well, when we specify our system, right, here's our differential equation. Um, let's go ahead and just sort of uh, make some parameters. So, so the actual time constant of our synapses, uh, synapse, we're going to say is five milliseconds. But what we want is a system that uses that has a 50 mill that effectively has a 50 millisecond time constant. Okay. So, and our rule is, I mean, I showed you all that math, but the the punchline of that uh, of that math is a relatively straightforward rule to follow. So, the differential equation that I really would like to do um, is um, how do we want to write this? Uh, um, so, dy dt is um, the, so let's write that out to x minus y divided by tau desired. So that's the differential equation I want to approximate. And the rule is for approximating that, that hey, when you make your input connection from A to B, uh, so you have some synapse that we actually have, let's use the variable that we've just created. Um, and then the rule is the function that should be being computed on here is, what is it? Um, this is our feed forward one. Take whatever that part of the differential equation is that's about that input and multiply it by tau, the tau of our synapse. So what part of this equation is about the input? That would be x. So, uh, so, but it's x divided by tau desired. So x divided by tau desired, All right? So that's the part of the differential equation that's about x. And then we're gonna multiply that by tau synapse. Okay, and that's the function That needs to get approximate on the input. On the recurrent connection, it is take whatever part is about the internal stored variable, multiply that by tau, and then add whatever that internal variable is. Okay. <laughs> so what's that going to be? So the part of this that's about y is uh, I'm going to change my variable here. So this is y minus y divided by tau desired. So that's that's the y part of this equation. And then the rule is multiply this by tau synapse and then add y. 
And that's the function that I need to do on my recurrent connection, and the synapse should be tau synapse. Okay, this is a little weird, um, but now if I run that, all right, it looks like it's just sort of, yay, it's doing the same sort of passing information through, fine. If I change my input quickly, it takes a while to change. All right. All right. I'm still using a five millisecond synapse at the lowest level. Right. If we and if we want as a reminder to see what that looks like, what I can do is I can say, all right, I'm going to change this to what my tau desired is five milliseconds. Right. So what does a five millisecond filter look like? Right. That's a much faster change. Still not instant, but it's much faster. Right. And indeed, if we now take a look at this case of if the what's desired is the same as the synapse, well then our feed forward is going to be x divided by that times that, those two things are going to cancel. My feed forward connection is just going to be an identity function. And this recurrent connection is going to be, well, that and that is going to cancel. Minus y plus y is zero. This recurrent connection is now computing zero. And the connection weights that can best compute zero is a big giant set of connection weights. It's all zero. So that's exactly what it's going to do. Um, so in this particular, there's a good sanity check on what we just did, is in this particular case, if the dynamics of the neurons themselves are exactly what we want, then cool, we don't need a recurrent connection. But this is saying that if my my internal low-level physics, you know, whatever my chip is, or whatever, you know, um, whatever low-pass filter is in my hardware, if I want the effective system to have a different low-pass filter, um, I can go ahead and do that. Okay, so I can get a whole bunch of very fast-acting um, synapses to approximate a low, uh, a slow-acting system. There's going to be, of course, be some limit to this. Like if I say the tau desired is now going to be a full second. Yeah, it does not look like it's going to take a full second, right? And this is about this is because neurons are not perfectly approximating our function. Um, if I increase the number of neurons, it will eventually perfectly do a good job of approximating that. Um, but um, that's going to make you get a little bit out of range. Um, but certainly if I have something like, I don't know, maybe the actual underlying physics has 100 milliseconds and I want a one second, um, then I should be fine. That's a much, much slower system. So I can get a bunch of fast acting components to approximate a much slower system. But here's an interesting question. What if I have a whole bunch of slow synapses? And again, let's do the 100 milliseconds just to sort of see what a slow synapse looks like, right? So this is, so here is I'm saying, all right, my synapses act really slowly, okay? What if I did this? What if I wanted my synapses to be much, much faster than they actually are? So I've got low level, Physic, you know, the actual synapses themselves are incredibly slow. I've got these really long low-pass filters in, in my system. I want the system to act quickly. Right? This, this clearly can't work. Right? What's going to break? Because nothing in the math I just showed said anything about the, you know, desired being smaller or larger than, than the actual synapse. So what's going to happen when I run this? Any guesses? No. Let's try it. Make a sudden change. Oh. It works fine. Trust the math. The underlying synapses are incredibly slow, but it found connection weights using this technique that I just showed there such that the overall system acts much, much faster than the individual components. Right. Of course, there's going to be some limit if, you know, if the synapses are, I don't know, have a 10 second time constant on them. I'm sure that will, oh, actually, yeah. <laughs> that's also working fine. I'm sure there will be some limit, um, but the underlying point is um, the math just works out. The math is about how, given whatever dynamics we're given of the particular neuron model um, and hardware that we have, um, please go ahead and figure out the connection weights. They're gonna work fine for this task. Cool. Um, 
So that's useful if you have particular differential equations you now want to approximate, that's great. Um, I will comment that there is one kind of special differential equation that's really quite common to end up needing, which is an integrator. Um, and the nice thing is the integrator turns out to be a really, really, really simple one to go ahead and compute. Okay, just if you take a look at the math here, all right, it turns out to be really quite simple with that, um, with that construction. Um, and what it ends up being, so we don't have a tau desired anymore. Um, so the feed forward ends up being um, just x times tau synapse. The recurrent connection just ends up being 0 times tau synapse plus y. So that just ends up being y. <laughs> um, and since these functions are so simple, we don't even need to specify them as functions. They're both linear functions. So I could have just said transform is tau synapse. No, delete this and delete that. That's the identity function. So I don't even need to specify anything for that. Right. So if I do that, now what I've got is I've got a system that computes the integral of its input. Okay. Go ahead and run that. Feeding a zero, I get a value out. It goes and increases. I put an input of zero. It now stops increasing its value. Put in a negative value. Stop it. It goes and increases that. I have neurons that are going ahead and computing the integral of their input. Why might I need that? All sorts of, you know, certainly when I've done cognitive models that are sort of modeling different uh, parts of the biological systems, I've used this as sort of models of working memory, um, models in motor, there's lots of places in motor control where you want to compute the integral of your, of your control signal. Um, but it's kind of a, it's a, it turns out to be a, something really quite simple to, um, to compute. Um, and the syntax sort of supports it nicely. One thing, if you are ever playing with these sorts of recurrent connections, generally you tend to want to have a fairly long time constant. Um, it's actually something biology does, is a lot of times when you're finding recurrent connections, they tend to have long time constants. Um, it just tends to be a little bit more stable. So if I, if I did a very, very fast um, time constant on this recurrent connection, you will notice that it doesn't respond particularly. Ooh that responds really, really badly. I'd probably just need more neurons. <laughs> just tends to have a really hard time approximating these functions. So there we go. It managed to do something. Oh, wow, it's just doing a horrible job at it. So um, we generally find with these recurrent connections, um, it's mostly because of the fact that this input is getting multiplied by that tau synapse. And so you need to have a very, very close uh, approximation on that value. Um, but in any case, um, important safety tip when doing that, you need at least something reasonable in your hardware. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and compute that fine. All right. Um, oh, right. I will also notice that the other reason a lot of people want to use differential equations is for pattern generators, oscillators. Um, and again, you can just come up with whatever sort of oscillator, oscillator differential equation you want and go ahead and implement it. Um, there is also something that's particularly useful, again, because you can go ahead and implement any differential equation, it doesn't have to be linear, you can also do controlled oscillators. So you can have an oscillator that is producing some sort of pattern, um, and then you can control its speed. Um, I won't go through the examples on coding that up because you can just do it inside. So there's inside Nango itself, uh, there ought to be, hmm. well, I don't know why that's not showing up for me, but for you, there should be a, a built-in tutorials example there. Um, and one of the options in there is oscillators. And so you can just take a look at those examples um, as well as chaotic attractors. Yes, you can implement the Lorentz attractor. It's just a differential equation. Go ahead and implement that. Um, and it, go, it, you know, it approximates the, the Lorentz attractor or whatever, or whatever chaotic attractor you want. Um, but again, there's no problem given the tools that we just showed here. Okay, so that was a pretty good whirlwind overview of the high level abstractions that are supported by Nango, um, and in particular, what's called the neural engineering framework. Um, and it's this general idea that 
for that particular type of thing, if if all you know about your neurons is, hey, they produce some sort of output, it might be spiking, it might not, um, and I can form connection weights, and I can form synapses, um, if you have those components, then cool, you can approximate functions. Um, you're going to get filtered versions of those functions because of your synapses, and the moment you produce recurrent connections, now you can approximate differential equations as well. So that's the class of things that you can do on that. Um, the functions themselves, Yes, with enough neurons, you can approximate any function to as much as you want, because you generally have a limited number of neurons. Um, generally, you're going to hit the same sorts of things with any neural network, which is, hey, you know, you're going to get some sort of smooth version of that function. Um, it might not be exactly the function you ask for, but with more neurons, you get more accurate approximation. Um, and then if you want to do these building up larger systems, then really all you're doing is you're trying to build up a system that looks kind of like this. You've got some variables, you've got some functions being computed. And then the idea with Nango is you can just specify these sorts of high level things, um, and then it'll go ahead and automatically convert that into neurons. You can of course combine that with the sort of more hand designed sorts of things, or you can also combine that with online learning. So all the things that I started, started with at the very beginning, they all fit within the same framework. Um, one way you can think of everything I just talked about here is just sort of like a really weird way of initializing your neural network. Um, instead of randomly initializing your network, you can initialize it with the sorts of connection weights that you think um, it should be. Um, you know, or, or you know, if, if you want to then do further learning, um, you can, of course, begin because Nango is um, connected nicely to TensorFlow. You can, of course, then just do, you can build your network this way and then do backprop across the whole thing and improve it even farther. Um, but um, all of those things um, are supported and possible. Uh, we also have some nice some theory where you can actually start arguing, well, what do we mean by smooth functions? Um, one thing you can do is you have a particular neuron model and you're like, okay, what are the functions that this neuron would be really good at approximating? Um, one thing you can do is just take those tuning curves, take the activity of the neurons in that middle hidden layer um, do singular value decomposition on it, and you will actually find, oh, this is the set of things, the set of basis functions um, that these neurons would be good at approximating. Um, if you have normal leaky integrate and fire neurons and a bunch of other basic neuron types, um, uh, and if you have this sort of distribution of activities, which is sort of the default randomly generated um, uh, Nengo gains and biases, um, then it turns out that you, what you're good at approximating is low degree polynomials. Um, if you do SVD on this data, you get the Legendre bases. Um, lots more that could be said about that, but I just figured I would just note it. All right, um, but all of those things that I just said is incredibly generic across hardware and across neuron models and things like that. Um, and so that's why uh, with Nengo, we're like, okay, you can just go ahead and, and specify, you know, certainly if you're specifying things at the neuron level, then fine, it really matters what neuron model you're using. But if you're specifying things at this more abstract level, then you can totally ignore what what neuron models it is or what hardware you're running it on um, and just swap those sorts of things out. Um, Nengo has really good support for CPUs and GPUs. Um, it also, and then also anything that TensorFlow runs on. Um, so those are those are in, in you know, pretty good shape. Everything seems to just run pretty much identically across all of those. Uh, Luigi is also pretty well polished. Um, I'll actually just do an example of that. Um, just cause, hey, why not? It's Luigi. Um, so for instance, if we just, uh, so if you, if you want to run what we've been talking about here um, on some other hardware. Um, well, first of all, you need to install the back end for that hardware. Um, so that's going to be pip install Nengo Luigi. Um, I might already have installed Nengo Luigi. Looks like I have, um, but that's what you would do to go ahead and do that. Um, and then when you run Nengo, you can say, all right, please use Nengo Luigi uh, when I'm running that. I don't happen to have a Luigi board connected to my computer right now. So what Nengo Luigi is going to do is it's actually going to run it against an emulator um, of the Louis keyboard. Um, so we should be able to see that. Um, it's not a perfect emulator, but it's but it's pretty good. Um, and so, and we can still do something like, I don't know, make another ensemble. Neurons is 100, dimensions is one. 
uh, and go whoops can't type uh, func x and oh, return x squared again and go connection a to b function equals func okay so you can build these things exactly the same as before uh, but now when i press play it's going to be running that against the oh no and of course my computer has crashed oh okay there is no way it should be running that slow let me try this again All right, that's better. No idea what happened. But, okay. So on Luigi, it's a slightly different neuron model. I mean, because you've, there's all sorts of interesting bitwise approximations going on and things like that. Um, and so it's not exactly the same as leaky rate fire neurons. Um, there's also all of the, uh, the fact that the connection weights have to be discretized and things like that. Um, so all of those things are being taken into account. Um, and so you can see very different sorts of performance. Um, and if I did have an actual physical Luigi board, um, then it would, we could just run it on the uh, Luigi itself. Um, similar, we have FPGA support somewhat. So the FPGA support right now is limited to, we can put one of the ensembles on an FPGA um, and we can run the learning rule um, just because that particular combination has turned out to be really powerful. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with even just, just one group of neurons doing um, a supervised learning rule. Um, we also have some support on Nango Spinnaker um, that was pretty full-fledged, but it hasn't been updated in a while, so you might have to go back to an earlier version of Nango. Uh, the syntax is all still the same, though. Um, the fact that we can do the sorts of different backends has made it really easy to go do some energy comparisons, so like exactly the same same conceptual model, um, but different details at the sort of the lowest level. Um, and that lets us do sort of direct uh, fair comparisons on different hardware. Um, on the left is sort of the energy consumption for um, a keyword spotting example, which is just a more, you know, not using this, any, this weird representation stuff I was just showing, but more just doing a feed forward uh, neural network uh, trained with uh, deep learning or with backdrop. Um, so you can get some, okay, some nice energy efficiency numbers there. Um, and that's all just running the same model, different backends um, using Nengo. Um, on the right, uh, we have uh, a bunch of different things doing an adaptive motor control task. Um, and looking at, in this case, both power consumption and uh, control loop latency. Um, so those are both papers that um, have been published to archive by uh, Applied Brain Research. Um, so cool, so we have backends. That could be useful for all sorts of fun things. Um, I will also comment that those nodes that we've been using, um, you can that's how we would also do, like because they can, they can do arbitrary Python code in those nodes, that's how you would do inputs and outputs. So like if you wanna grab data from a DVS or send data to a push bot or Lego, Mind, Lego Mindstorms is what I use for robotics a lot. Um, you can also grab data from game controllers, um, uh, open AI gym, just whatever sort of IO you want, as long as Python can talk to it, you can go ahead and make that code work. Um, there's also, um, as that little video was showing down there, um, some integration between nodes and the GUI. Um, if your node also, your, your node can also output HTML, um, and HTML includes, including SVG. Um, so that means that if you write your Python code that generates some sort of HTML or graphical output, um, that is nicely integrated within the um, within the user interface that I was showing. So that can be really handy for making custom visualizations um, or you know little environments um, where that poor little agent is running away. Um, so you can build sort of simple um, virtual environments that way pretty nicely or integrate to existing uh, environments. Um, things that we have built with this. Um, just to give a sort of a whirlwind overview of things that we've done. Um, one thing that we've done is uh, Spawn. This was uh, it's still the world's largest functional brain simulation. 
uh, two and a half million spiking neurons. This was meant to sort of map onto, um, we were trying to be sort of map onto biology and map onto the biological systems. Um, here it is doing a working memory task, visually being shown a bunch of digits, have to remember things, uh, have to repeat out the, the sequence of digits. Um, and we did lots of comparisons trying to look at, okay, does it make the same sorts of mistakes that people do? Um, that's more sort of a cognitive modeling research. Um, uh, but all using exactly the techniques that I just showed, basically you have to take all of the tasks that I just described there and turn them into functions and differential equations um, and map that onto different brain areas. Um, and that turns out to be possible. So that's um, a cool line of research there. Um, and of course we need interesting neuromorphic hardware to run that well um, at the moment. The best we're able to do, um, yeah. Uh, so at, at the moment, we are sort of very pushing limits of GPUs in order to run that. And sort of one of our one of the reasons that we've been working closely with Luigi and Spinnaker in the past was in order to run models like that um, on those hardware. Um, other sorts of things that we've shown. Um, so this is more an example using of using the deep learning stuff. Um, so this is just standard classic image net, here's an image, go ahead and recognize it. Um, we've got some nice hooks into the deep learning TensorFlow stuff to let it work well uh, to train up spiking neurons. Um, if you want your, your the resulting system to be spiking neurons. Um, so, uh, so that exists, again, all part of the same system. Um, the adaptive motor control thing that I sort of briefly mentioned um, before, um, the idea there, um, is you can have that supervised learning, so exactly the same learning rule that I was showing at the very, very beginning. Um, so just delta rule. Um, turns out if you construct your error signal in the right way, um, it turns out to be really good at learning what sort of extra force that a, a robot arm needs to apply when it's given an unexpected weight. Um, so the idea here is that you can, um, uh, you can still do force control on, on your motor control arm. Um, and uh, the, yeah, okay, let me, let me start at the beginning. So normal robot arm control is non-compliant, sort of standard PID control, just go to a particular point, And if a person's in the way, it's going to hurt you. Um, so that's called non-compliant control. Um, and Chris is there demonstrating that. Um, and then there's compliant control where you've got a good physics model of the environment and you just figure out how much force should you apply right now to go to where you want to go. Um, and if you do that, you get this nice compliant system. It'll go to where you want um, and it's safe to be around because you can shove it around. If your person gets in the way that it doesn't expect, it's just going to you know, stop nicely. Um, but the problem with compliant control is you give it an unexpected weight like Chris has just done here. Um, now all of a sudden the forces are wrong. Right? It's like, oh, I, you know, I'm applying how much force that I, I think I need to do, but I'm not going to the spot that I'm at, okay? or that I want to be at. And so that's the problem with compliant controls. It requires a really good physics model of, of your situation. Um, if you take compliant control and add on a little bit of group of neurons that is, able to, that is doing exactly this sort of learning, um, and it turns out you feed in your PD control signal as the error signal to those neurons, which is a little weird, um, then it turns out um, that the system actually learns to a physics model of the, um, the extra forces needed to compensate for whatever its current situation is while it's still being compliant. Right? Um, and so you know, it quickly learns that and it'll learn that you need different forces in different situations and it'll go ahead and, um, and work fine with that. So that's one of the applications that we've been looking at a lot um, uh, for this control rule. Um, so that's an interesting application. Um, uh, what are other sorts of things we've done? I think I've got, here's, all right, here's, let's, we can use neurons to do a planning task. This is neurons doing a tower of Hanoi task. Um, you've got a bunch of disks. You want to move them to different locations. Um, it's an interesting challenge to try to take such a task and write it in terms of differential equations. But once you do, you can go ahead and encode that uh, and build up, um, and build up models of sort of sequential planning and things like that. Um, and then here's an actually an example we, that came together from Telluride a few years ago, um, where uh, we're trying to do some sort of foosball simulation here. Um, and what we're doing here is we've got neurons learning or that have or that are predicting a path, um, and that's just the function approximation. That is just literally okay. We gathered a bunch of data, have neurons approximate this function of 
the ball is at this location with this velocity. Where do I think it's going to be in the future? And I'm plotting the result in sort of a custom way there. Um, this display was built using taking a node and just generating some SVG. Um, and then on the left there is we're actually also using that adaptive controller to control the positions of the players. Um, the, uh, the squares is where the, um, the, the network thinks it needs to move the players to, um, or perhaps vice versa. Uh, blue dots is where that, that is. All right, so these are just sorts of things that you can build using the components that I've just sort of shown. All right, uh, that's it for this tutorial. Um, yeah, there, Nango does have built-in tutorials. Um, you can click on and sort of and view those. Um, there is also a bunch of documentation and examples online um, at this Nango.ai website. Um, there's an online discussion forum, forum.nango.ai. Uh, um, so we also have a collection of sort of extended lectures um, uh, at that uh, on YouTube. Um, we normally do a two-week summer school on this stuff, uh, and this year we, because we weren't having a summer school, we decided we would just record all of our lectures and post them online. Um, and of course, the best way to get even more stuff is to just email me um, and hang out with me at during the rest of Telluride, because um, I'm hoping to um, you know, do all sorts of interesting projects with these components with all of you. Okay, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for listening, um, and I hope you have as much fun with Mango um, as I do. Thank you, and talk to you later.